this morning. I may have to um, take a sip of coffee every once in a while, and I'm the only one legally allowed in here to do that, right? And uh, it's so, um, I'm not, I don't even have cream and sugar in it, so that's, I drink coffee about three times a year, so, but if I need it to help me get through, then I will, praise God. God is good. God is faithful. Thank you for being here this morning. So this morning I want to begin and I want to, I want to look first of all in Matthew 25 and, um, you know, this sermon may just be all over the place. I don't know. So y'all just bear with me, um, you know, but God's given us and he's given every believer a kingdom mantle for increase. Amen. Did you know you've been given a mantle for increase? Amen. And it's the will of God, no matter what your call is, no matter your position, no matter your, your, uh, what you have in life, your gifts, whatever. But God's given all of us principles for increase. Amen. And it's because that every, he has a desire that every generation, right, enter into a greater dimension of revival and awakening. Amen. Your, your children are supposed to enter into a greater dimension of revival and awakening than you knew, right? I, I should be in a greater dimension of revival and awakening than my parents, my grandparents, than they experienced because God's given us a call and there are mantles I believe, available to each one of us that we have not picked up, right? But it's a moment where God's calling us to enter into something, and he's called us to enter into increase, amen? So I want to look at Matthew 25. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture, a very familiar parable, but the whole point of this is, is that God wants increase in his kingdom, right? He wants the kingdom to grow in our lives personally, in our families, and to grow corporately, amen? So I just want to read, I know this is kind of a lengthy uh, parable, but I want to begin reading in verse 14, okay? For it is like in Jesus teaching on the kingdom. Do we need to understand the mysteries of the kingdom? Absolutely, we need to understand what the kingdom looks like, how it functions, how it operates, amen. It says, for it is like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. And immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who had received the one talent went away and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Amen. Faithfulness means generally you get more to do. Hallelujah. The one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, You entrusted to me two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. 
Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to every one who has shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Hallelujah. So, crazy parable, and I mean, we could preach a lot. There's a lot of different things you could talk about in that parable and all those things. And, you know, the thing is, a talent, re- literally in the context of this passage, and my sermon's really not about money, so y'all can rest, okay? But a talent, literally, and this is an amount of money, amen? And uh, the, the reality is, though, that God gives us kingdom currency that we have to use to increase the extent the and, and to extend the kingdom. Now, again, this money, <coughs> excuse me, it's not about money. However, there is a, a reality that we can't deny, right? Um, money is a training ground, right? It even says in Luke 16 that, um, you know, if we don't know how to handle unrighteous mammon, God won't entrust true riches to us. You know that? Money is a training ground in your life, right? It reveals what's in your heart, amen? And, and you know, I was skimming through Ian Carroll's book again the last few days, and um, Ian won't even counsel someone if they're not tithing. He says, take care of that and come back, and then we'll talk, right? There's a training that comes from how we handle money, but and that's just that's just one aspect of this parable, though. Amen. God has called us to prosper. Now, when you talk about prosperity, people get a little nervous. Okay, but there's a reality that prosperity is is about increasing what the Lord has given us. Okay, so keep that in mind when I use that term. Okay. Uh, And God gives us certain things that he wants us to steward and be faithful with in order that increase may come. Now, we're in a moment right now in the Christian school where we need your prayers. Not because there's a lack. There's so much happening in our Christian school right now. We honestly don't know how to keep up. We're, We're being inundated and there's such radical growth, and I feel like the Lord said, okay, here were these five talents that I gave you years ago, 10, 11 years ago. And you know what? When we, when we started it, it, wasn't, it, it didn't look like much. True? A little storefront, 13 students, and, and here we are years later. How many calls are you getting or emails are you getting every day right now? two to six a day right now. It's, it's overwhelming, and I feel like the, the, that, slave, that slave owner who's like, okay, you multiplied what I gave you. Here's more, right? It's a good problem, right? But it starts because we take what the Lord gives us, and we're like, God, I just want to be faithful and diligent with what you've given Right, and sometimes this isn't even in my notes. Sometimes diligence and faithfulness, um, those aren't exciting words, are they? But really, it's in the moments where we have to be the most diligent and the most faithful, where the greatest growth will happen in our lives. Amen. And so that's such a kingdom principle that God's like, okay, I'm I'm giving you increase. I'm giving you prosperity. Amen. And again, that we don't reject prosperity because of abuses and and imbalances that are out there. Amen. Um, But we, I believe we're in a moment where we've got to have more love, more power, more divine strategies. And I believe this coming weekend is about further divine strategies. We've got to have more success in relationships, whether it's family or kingdom relationships. We've got to have more finances. We've got to have more physical health. Amen. Uh, good grief, you know. I mean, I didn't need to lose a week. 
I just didn't. And there's still things I had to do. I'm still teaching and I'm still in the middle of teaching an online class with no voice. That's fun, right? Um, we need more protection. Amen. We need more anointing if we're to fulfill the great commission and disciple nations. Amen. Do you know if you're going to disciple nations, and that's what God's called us to do, if the church is going to disciple nations, we need great prosperity. Money and beyond money, okay? And God just wants to give increase, amen? Because really, God never intended the church to live in any season without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, amen? And, and, and because it's the outpouring of the Spirit that generates increase, amen? We're to live in a culture of an outpouring of the Spirit. Amen. That the, the outpouring of the Spirit hasn't stopped since the day of Pentecost. Right? I, I, I would say it's, it's only even increased, and God's always moved throughout history, but in the last 100 and 120 years, there's been such a significant increase of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Part of it is because we're becoming aware of what's available to us as the body of Christ. Amen. There's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, God, God built a culture of testimony in Israel, right? He did things, and, you know, we live in a time where people think, well, you know, you've got you've to um, observe the feast, and if you're not, you're out of the will of God, and, uh, or don't observe the feast. If you do, you're out of the will of God. If you don't, you're out of the will of God, right? I'm really not trying to address all that today. The whole point is God established a culture where the people of God remembered the great things that he had done, right? And that, you know, the people of God would gather and they would reflect on what God had done. And it was, God said, I've set up these times where I want you to remember what I've done and the powerful things I've done. Because what happens when we forget the powerful things that God has done in our lives? Right. What happened to Israel when they forgot about the powerful things that God did? They went into sin. Right. They went into idolatry. They moved away from pursuit. And so God was very strategic about creating this culture. Amen. And he wanted them to remember the past because it was meant to ignite a passion for today. Amen. And so, you know, the outpouring of the Spirit. When you look, I love church history. I love revival history. You guys know that I, that I, I do. We've talked about it a lot. But, you know, always, there's always been times in the past when a, a person or a group of people just determined that where they were, as good as it was, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And there's something that began to grip them wherever they were, whoever they were in history. They're like, God, there's more. There's more. I see something that we in the body of Christ aren't quite living yet in. There's more. You know, we can have a lot of knowledge and we can have a lot of, of, of wisdom, but we have to get this thing of revelation that burns in us. Because knowledge just puffs us up. Oh, yeah, I've studied that revival. Oh, yeah, I've read about that person. But what about the understanding and the revelation that we can get a hold of that takes us into a fresh encounter with a living God that not only transforms us, but begins to grip people around us and to take us into something greater than we're experiencing at the moment. And I love reading in history when that began to happen to people. And they begin to move into something. And God said, here, 
Here, I'm giving you a talent. And I'm not talking literally about talent, right? I'm giving you something of my spirit, and I'm giving you something of my word, and I'm giving you something of my presence that if you'll lay hold of it in faith and you'll stir it in faith and you'll stir it in diligence, I'll break you into something even greater, and your breakthrough will take a whole group of people, and it'll take a whole the body of Christ into another place of revival and awakening and transformation. That's got to stir in us. That's got to stir in us. And sometimes in life, man, you just want to lay that aside. Right? I mean, we've had so many words as a body about what God wants to do in this place, in this city. And, you know, sometimes I hear, you know, they, the word comes again. I'm just like, oh, God. That's such a great word, but I know the responsibility that comes with it. I know the call to things like prayer and fasting that we're not yet in. That we're not yet in, but we have to lay a hold of to break through into something else. And I read the accounts, you know, about the people because it stirs something within me stirs something within me to ignite passion, right? When I start feeling overwhelmed in life, right? I start thinking, God, I can't even get through my systematic theology class. How are we going to get to revival, right? And I start reading accounts of people like John Wesley. Man, this guy who got ignited He saw a group of Moravians on a ship that was about to go down, and they were so worshiping God. He's like, they they have something that I don't have. They believe that's when Wesley got genuinely born again. He was already a minister. Yikes. (laughs) Something began to get on him because Revival and awakening is viral. And you can always you can always trace moves of God to the previous move of God. And there was something from the Moravian revival, and you can study that if you've been here any time, you know about that. But it began to get on Wesley, and Wesley began to hunger. He began to hunger for something that wasn't in the church at that moment, that wasn't in his experience at that moment. And he so hungered, and he would go to churches that wouldn't let him preach because he was too radical of an Anglican, right? Our equivalent of an Anglican minister here is an Episcopalian. I don't know a lot of radical Episcopalians. I'll be honest. There are some, I'm sure, right? But there was something of Wesley that began to burn, and because they wouldn't let him preach in the churches, he'd go out in the fields, and he'd preach, and you know, we love the story around here where Wesley would go out and there was something supernatural because he'd go out and he'd preach to thousands and he didn't need a mic. It was something supernatural that happened. And he'd stand in those fields and he'd preach and he'd, he's the guy that would tell people, don't get in the trees because he knew the anointing was going to come sweeping in those meetings. And when it did, people would fall out of the trees because, you know, Anybody here ever get knocked out in the spirit? What happens when that type of anointing comes when you're out in the pasture in a tree? They're falling out of the trees because the power of God. And he was saying, don't, don't get in the trees, right? And there was something of the presence on Wesley. And he, he started this movement. Now, it's hard to keep movement's going sometimes and his movement is in great turmoil today because of some sinful things that are going on right now i'm not bad mouthing methodist man there's some powerful powerful methodists today but that movement is at a crossroads right now right but wesley burned he burned for something and he's the guy that whether it's true or not he's given credit for the quote that, um, what is it, what 
one generation tolerates will become the normal for the next generation. Right? You know, Jamie and I talk about this before. You know, man, we, we've lived almost legalistic in some ways. Some people would say some of the things that we've done were really legalistic, you know. But what happens when we begin to relax those things? What does it produce in next generations? You know, it produces a lot of sin. It produces a lot of compromise. You know, I mean, even in the Christian school, there's sometimes we're dealing with stuff that 10 years ago we never expected to deal with. It's shocking. There's something that's got to burn in us for his presence where we don't just live in status quo Christianity because right now status quo to Christianity really stinks. Now at the same time, there's incredible, incredible things happening all over the world. I mean, what happened in Brazil with the sand, which is a nation that was already in revival? Right? I mean, what ha- what's been happening in Brazil for the last 10, 20 years is significant. When the president, and I know there are mixed reports, but supposedly he was already born again, but basically said at the sand, I'm a born again Christian. And it ignited something in Brazil. Right? St- stuff still happening with people like Kanye and some of these guys. There's this, there's this burning, burning revival and awakening that's coming forth in the nations. Man, we have to have it here. It has to burn in us here. It has to burn in us. It has to ignite us. I love studying people like Mariah Woodworth at her. Yeah. A woman preacher, especially in the 1800s, That's radical, and she was so radical that they sent her to the rough places because she's the one who could break through. Stuff would happen in her meetings. People would go into trances and see visions of heaven and hell. And there's another message that people don't really like right now because we're conforming God to our image. People who are untaught and didn't know about these things, they're seeing heaven and hell and knowing they have a choice. They get saved in those encounters because, yeah, hello. And there were reports of people up to 100 miles away from her meetings falling out under the power. It cost her something. Her husband left her, right? But she burned for something. And and even what I love about her, even in the course of her life, was that she made a transition and was baptized in the Spirit, right? Don't you love that, that people stay hungry enough when God starts doing something new? We don't understand what a big deal it was when people started getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she made a transition in her ministry because she hungered for more. And she broke into something because of that hunger. And she broke into something even though society said, you can't do this. And she broke into something and there was incredible fruit that came out of her life because she was hungry for more. Man, John G. Lake. It's funny because (laughs) Will's already had gold dust all over his hands, and he didn't even know I was going to talk about John G. Lake. Give me a moment, and I'll get there. (laughs) 
right? Whenever people talk about John G. Lake, who's a well-known revivalist, Will gets gold dust on his hands, right? So this morning he's like, I think I've got, I don't know if this is glitter or gold dust. And I was like, what's interesting, because I'm going to talk about John G. Lake, right? There's an anointing that's already present, right? But John G. Lake, man, he, he broke into something. And he wasn't perfect. None of these people I'm talking about are perfect. You know, he even lost a wife on the mission field in South Africa because she wore herself out caring for the sick. She died. But Lake pushed into something. And he began to minister in Spokane, Washington with healing rooms. And in those rooms impacted Spokane so much and so many people got healed that at that time, Spokane was the healthiest city in the United States. What happens when we steward what God has given to the point that it begins to change the cultural and regional dynamic of where we are? When suddenly something comes on a people because they begin to hunger for something. You know, sometimes it's hard to stir things in the beginning when it's small. Right? You're just believing for a miracle. You haven't seen anything. Right? And then suddenly people start getting healed. Right? And they start calling you that crazy church. (laughs) But you know what happens? Is people start coming when they're sick. Or they start coming by and they start calling you because they're like, you know, my church don't believe in this. And I really don't want you to know that I'm here, them to know that I'm here. But will you pray for me? Because there's something that starts changing because as a people, you start laying hold of something. Amen? You start laying hold of something of his presence because God's given you a talent. It's like, what are you going to do with what I'm giving you? What are you going to do? Are you going to lay a hold of it? Are you going to stir it? Are you going to grow? And you know, here's the thing. We can applaud these revivalists. I love stories about that, right? But we really only honor them if we imitate them by coming to know the God they knew and demonstrating his kingdom in our day. Now, I don't just want to sit here and preach sermons or read accounts or watch videos in supernatural school. We're all like, wasn't that awesome? No, I, I, want, to, I want that to get on us. I want it to get on me. I want to lay a hold of that, which the Lord has been pouring out, and I want to... I want to grow it, right? I want to be diligent, right? Isn't it funny that we have to be diligent to enter into things that we can only get a hold of by His grace, right? But there's an element of pursuit. There's an element of believing that we have to be intentional about about laying a hold of, amen? Amen. There's this, I, I, there's this great cloud of witnesses. Man, I don't understand what that scripture means. Right? But I believe they're waiting to see what we will do with the baton that's been given to us. What will we do with the revelation that the body of Christ is beginning to live in? What will we do with the anointing that the Lord is pouring out? Amen. You know, I was reflecting on a really, really strange scripture. (laughs) It's the, the whole story of Elisha, Elijah. And you know, Elijah had this powerful mantle. And Elisha 
pursued it. He served Elijah because he wanted the anointing, the mantle. You know, and I know there have been tons of sermons preached about that and about spiritual fathers and spiritual sons and all those things that are past and that there's so much truth in all of that. But Elisha received that same mantle and that same anointing. And I think if you study those things out, he did twice as many anointing and twice as many miracles. They were recorded in the scripture, except there was one. He was one short, right? Then there came a moment where, you know, he's dead and buried. Here's his bones and this hole in the ground. And they're burying a guy, performing a funeral. And there's some raiders coming, right? And so they're like, oh, my gosh, we got to finish this funeral and get out of here. So they toss this guy's body in this grave. And he hits Elisha's bones and comes back to life. Is that just like the weirdest story, you know? Can you imagine what kind of funeral that was? Oh, we got to get out of here. They're coming. They're going to steal stuff from us. Just toss Billy in there. And Billy pops back up. Billy's alive, right? It's such a weird story, you know? And so exactly double miracles of what Elijah had done. God's faithful, right? But the greater reality that's really convicting is why had no one picked up the mantle of Elisha? Elisha went after Elijah's mantle. He said, man of God, I'm serving you. I'm serving you. He served him and he cared for him and he, he pursued what God was doing. He wasn't one of these people who said, I need a spiritual father so you'll just promote my ministry. If someone doesn't know your name, they're not your spiritual father. I don't care how many podcasts you've listened to. Well, come on. If you don't have their phone number, that's some of the biggest stupidity right now in the body of Christ. It's dumb, right? (laughs) I mean, I love but Bill Johnson, and I know people call him Papa Bill, but he ain't my papa. I think he's amazing, right? He's he was part of my ordination, and he's laid hands on me and Jamie. So is Mama Heidi, but I can't call her Mama because we don't have her phone number. She doesn't know us. Right? She should right now. <laughs> but but there's this thing of this this mantle of Elisha that was waiting for someone to pick it up. And I think even as incredible as all these things that are happening in the earth right now. This call for revival and awakening, right? Who's going to pick up? Who's going to pick up this mantle? You're going to pick it up? She says me, right? Is there a generation that will pick this up? Maybe put their social media down and go put get on their face in the presence of God. A generation that will burn for his presence more than followers and likes. Where's a generation, and this includes adults, that will pay prices, may cost them relationships, may even cost them favor with the church, now, I'm very pro-church, y'all. You know that. 
but I'm not going to play religious games. I'm going to pursue him. I'm going to go after him. And I can only be responsible for what God's called me to do. Right? You got to pursue him. There's a there's a mantle, there's a call. There's a cost to picking up a mantle for revival. You know, we all, I, I, you know, I talk about Bill and Papa Bill and Mama Heidi, and Randy Clark. Randy does know my name. <laughs> it's taken years, but he knows my name, right? The scary thing is he looked at Jamie when we were at VOA and said, don't let Andy bury his mantle. That's a scary thought, and it gets scarier. Because we can have all these prophetic words. We can have all these things that have happened in the past. Oh, remember when God moved in the school and we couldn't have chapel in the morning? We had to do it in the afternoon. Man, those are great stories, and I love them. And they were a a foretaste. And God just giving us a a glimpse of something that he has said, there's more if if you'll go after it. We can have a collection of words from great speakers who've been here. Great words from people like Charlie Shamp. And Ryan Lestrange and Abner Suarez and amazing people like that. But if we don't become those people who will take hold and steward what we've been given. Oh, Lord, you've done some good things. Here's here's my talent. God, I'm... I'm hanging on to it. No, no, take it. Multiply it. Grow it. Because there's so much more he wants to do. You know, we work hard. and We pursue so many things. And even in ministry, I mean, just what it takes to keep the school going. Wow. If you were part of that, you know that. You know, there, there's, but there's this pursuit of him that has to come first. There's this pursuit of him And a willingness to lay aside everything else. Go after him. And I think we're good at pursuit. But I think there's more. I think there's more. I think we're at a moment where we have to determine God, are we going to live in what we know and what we've experienced, which is really great? Are we going to push? I don't know any other way to say it. If you're a grace person, you probably don't like that. I'm sorry, but there's there's something about a diligence and a pursuit that has to come to break into the next thing. Who will pick up the mantle of Elisha? Who will pick up that mantle for this city, for this region, for this state, for this generation? And who will burn for him? 
who'll count costs. Say, God, we have to have what you've promised. Even if, and I know the kingdom's bigger than us, y'all. Don't, you know. Even if we're the only ones. Now, there are others, right? Who'll pick up that mantle? Who'll pick up that call? Who'll pick up that that thing that keeps waiting for night and day worship and prayer? Oh, my gosh. And we've tried to start that here in the past with disastrous consequences. Almost destroyed us as a church. Because <laughs> it's something that Duh, who does the enemy want day and night worship and prayer? Not at all. Who'll pick up that anointing for the miraculous? Even when it costs. Even when you see people die from the very things that you're believing to see put down by the Lord. Who'll pick up that mantle? Wow, this is a really weighty word, right? But I think there come moments, good and bad, where we have to search our hearts and say, God, everything that you've done has been so wonderful and so powerful but lord you want to take us deeper we've got to be good stewards with what he's given us because the kingdom was meant for increase we're in a moment we have to go further. Father, today, we just yield to you, Lord. Lord, we live in such a culture of convenience. But Lord, sometimes you put a demand on people that is inconvenient. Lord, we ask for more today. God, we don't want to be people that miss a move of God because we miss you. Lord, we don't want to be a generation that goes backward instead of forward. Father, thank you for what you've given us. Father, we thank you that even in the midst of increase, which is good, Lord, we don't want to miss you. We don't want to miss your presence. We don't want to miss the strategies that you have from heaven. Lord, we don't want to lay down, God, the assignment for a revival. Father, there is a regional revival that you've promised us for well over a decade and that you were wanting to give it. And you said that we would, if, if, the, because we'd positioned ourselves for awakening, God, that you would give it. And so, Lord, I thank you that you're reminding us of that today. That there's a call on this body as a house of revival and awakening, as a house of glory, as a house of deliverance. And Father, we lay aside anything, any disappointment, 
any disappointment in delay, Father God, anything that's caused to hinder or restrict. And Lord, we say yes to you today that we want to be faithful stewards in your house. We want to be faithful to multiply and to increase what you've given us. So, Father, I thank you. Lord, I ask today, Lord, we just take what you've given us in this place, the church, the ministry school, the Christian school, the healing rooms, all those things. And, Lord, we just ask, God, that you just breathe on them and multiply that which you've given. Father, pour it out today. Pour out your glory today. We say yes to you today. Let's just stand in his presence for just a moment. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just make a fresh commitment today. And Father, we just lay aside any hope deferred, and we say yes to all your promises, Lord. Father, I ask that people that are struggling physically today, Father, I ask you just extend your hand to heal. Father, where there are circumstances that are negative and restricting, Father, I ask that you extend your hand. Father, there will always be circumstances to, to stop what you want to do. Always. But Lord, we choose today to run the race. And Lord, thank you for the commissioning that you give us. And Lord, today we pick up once again that mantle of revival, of awakening, of miracles to be a burning generation. Father, to be a burning generation that burns for you above all else. And we honor you today, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, God's good. So I challenge you this week. Right? I challenge you to pursue him. Right? I challenge you to take up what he's asked you to take up. Amen. I believe the next days are very strategic. I believe Ian Carroll has something very, very specific to impart to us as a body of believers. Amen. And let's step into that. Let's step into this moment of destiny. Be attentive to what the Lord's going to say to you in the days ahead, in these next hours. Wow. And I can hardly stand up, and I don't think it's the flu. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that further, that glory, that mantle, that commissioning that's even coming in right now. Father, there's something of your glory that's coming in in a greater measure, God, and we just say yes to you. We say yes to your glory. We say yes to your presence. We say yes to your word. Today, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Wow, amen? Amen. Wow, well, I feel good. Ooh. It's amazing what the anointing does. Amen, praise God. So, remember, Supernatural School tomorrow night, Ian Carroll Friday night, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning. If you need um, a prophetic ministry, we'll have our prophetic team here. If you need prayer for healing, physical healing team here. If you want to play um, softball, tell Dusty or Diana. And um, if you want to follow Jesus, just tell him yes. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> well, have a great day. Be blessed. Take care of yourself. And amen. Have a great day.